Welcome everyone. My name is Sierra Sanchez, webinar producer with CGLR. The webinar will begin at the top of the hour and will be recorded. We invite you to connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR. On Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. And on LinkedIn, subscribe to us at Campaign for GLR. Please use hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learned from today's webinar, and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, we'd love to connect, so follow those pages you see listed above, and we'll begin shortly. Okay, before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping details. First, we'd love for you to introduce yourself, so please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city, or state, and your organization. Be sure to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. The webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. A link to the recording as well as any resources or slides shared during the conversation will be sent in a follow-up email to all who registered. Finally, we'll be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during closing and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. I'd also like to turn your attention to GLR Week 2023. We are offering the Save the Date reminder that GLR Week will be held from July 17th through the 21st with the theme Bright Spots and Silver Linings. We'll be hosting multiple sessions as well as sponsoring many state-led events, and we hope you can join us. And finally, just wanted to call your attention to our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars. Next week, we invite you to wrap up the month of May with us with a session on opportunities and potential pitfalls, state expansion of education savings accounts. On June 6th, we'll have a funder to funder conversation at 1230 Eastern time. Leave no human behind. How are funders closing the gap in digital literacy? This session will be co-sponsored by the Patterson Foundation. And on June 13th, we have an exciting doubleheader, starting with a Housing Partners webinar on Rising to the Challenge, how housing agencies can support attendance and engagement in school, followed by a session on Nurture Connection, the movement for early relational health. Registration and information will be posted in the chat box now, and we hope you can join us. Joining you now is Becky Miles Polka, Senior Consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Sierra. And thanks to everyone who um, is on with us today live. And those of you who may be watching um, at a later time uh, to the recording. As we were um, on before the webinar actually started, um, we were talking about how busy this time of year is for everyone, um, particularly those of you who are in school districts are working closely with school districts. So we especially are grateful that you made the time to join us today. And I think you're gonna find that it's well worth your time. Um, we have a, a really thoughtful and terrific conversation planned for today. Um, this issue of chronic absence is, um, as you know, with the campaign, we've been working on it since the very beginning for over a decade now and um, making good headway along the way. And then, of course, the pandemic landed and that um, totally upset the, the apple basket. And now schools um, and communities are back to the drawing board, um, working together to um, figure out ways to get kids in school and keep them in school. And so our panel today is, of course, going to be hosted by our good friends at Attendance Works. And we have three um, models that um, folks from three different types of communities that are going to be sharing how they've addressed this. Um, we have um, a rural area from Idaho, we have more an urban area from New Jersey, and then a suburban urban statewide effort in Delaware. And you're going to hear, hear from each of, of these folks about the work um, that's underway there and how they've addressed it and how they're starting to address it moving forward. So I think with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and make some introductions and we'll get this conversation underway. 
Isela Arisa is the Associate Director of Programs at Attendance Works, where she supports the design, development, and services for state agencies, school districts, and schools to help reduce chronic absenteeism. And Isela is going to be telling us more about um, the 2023 Attendance Awareness Campaign. Uh, Rosie Grant is the Executive Director of the Patterson Education Fund, where she also serves as the program director for now 30 years. And the, the fund's programs are specifically designed to engage a broad cross-section of stakeholders in the improvement of Patterson Public Schools. Hortensia Hernandez served for five years as the community school coordinator for Sacagawea Elementary, where their attendance team dived deep into addressing chronic absenteeism. And these past two years, she has overseen the expansion and implementation of the community school strategy across her district. And finally um, is Ken Livingston. Ken is the current director for Get Delaware Reading with United Way of Delaware. And his primary focus is addressing the issue in Wilmington, where many children from the eight promise communities are identified as not reading proficiency, proficiently when exiting the third grade. And then um, our esteemed moderator, Hetty Chang. Hetty is the founder and executive director of Attendance Works, and many of you know Hetty. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Attendance Works is a national and state level initiative aimed at advancing student success by addressing chronic absence. And if you know Hetty, you know that she's deeply committed to promoting solutions to achieving a more just and equitable society. She has spent more than three decades working in the fields of family support, family economic success, education, and child development. And it's my pleasure and honor to um, hand the mic over to Hetty. Thank you so much, Becky, for that kind introduction and that fabulous overview of what we have to come today. Uh, let's take the next slide. Um, I know we got folks from a range of backgrounds, just want to make sure we're all operating off of the same page. So when we are talking about chronic absence, um, we are talking about when kids miss so much school for any reason that they're academically at risk. Um, that's two days in the first month, four days in the second month, six days in the third month, you know, it's including excuse, unexcused absences, suspensions. If you're not in school, then it means you can't benefit from those opportunities to um, connect, learn, gain access to resources. This is different from truancy, which is usually only referring to unexcused absences or average daily attendance, which is how many kids typically show up to school each day and which can mask high levels of chronic absence. I'm gonna, next slide focus just for a moment also on this term of truancy, which has existed long before the term of chronic absence. Truancy only counts unexcused absences. It emphasizes individual compliance with school rules. It talks, usually looks at legally, legal more blaming and punitive solutions. So there have been some improvements on that, but you're threatening court action because kids did not, uh, abide by state compulsory ed. And this is different from chronic absence, which uh, if you click again, is looking at all absences that make up that 10%. Click again. Emphasizes the impact of missed days on both social emotional development and learning. Uses preventive problem solving strategies that are really trauma, trauma sensitive. And it's about cultivating family and student engagement, starting in pre k and K, even if those aren't mandated by, mandated by state compulsory ed laws, you can, to prevent chronic absence, really want to cultivate the engagement of young children, helping them understand why school matters, um, helping them uh, overcome barriers and getting into a routine of attendance. And so that's why it's so important to think about this is about addressing chronic absence, shifting from a punitive approach to a positive approach problem solving approach. Next slide. Um, what we've seen is that absenteeism is a real leading indicator and a cause of educational inequity. It reflects challenges, whether those are in the community like unstable housing, unstable, uh, difficult, challenging transportation, uh, lack of access to health care, um, or in the school. 
uh, negative experiences that families have had, um, uh, problematic uh, disciplinary practices that can push kids out of school. And in both cases, those are things that both can affect kids learning while they're in the classroom, as well as cause them to miss more days and then ultimately fall further behind. Next slide. So chronic absence is especially a challenge for low-income kids whose development is actually, uh, literacy development is actually affected 75% more um, than their middle-class peers because they don't have access to the same kinds of resources to make up for uh, experiences in the classroom um, that promote literacy. Uh, and low-income kids are also more likely to face the bigger challenges that I mentioned um, that are systemic challenges that mean they're more likely to have multiple years of chronic absence if they're not addressed. Um, so they're more likely to be chronically absent and they're more affected. Next slide. I want to draw this connection to a slide that I know that Ralph Smith and the Campaign for Grade Level Reading have been talking about, which is um, based on that data, data from Charlotte Mecl Me Mecklenburg, which shows that, you know, kids, if they have a the gap in literacy that's there at the end of kindergarten is actually one that can persist all the way through third grade. What I want to offer up is that chronic absence, kids not showing up in kindergarten, is a major contributor to that gap. Given what we know about the adverse impact of missing out on learning experiences in kindergarten, especially for our kids struggling with poverty. Next slide. And we know that chronic absence in kindergarten ultimately can affect achievement later on. Lower reading and math, greater grade retention, more a greater likelihood of a suspension by the end of seventh grade, and again, continued patterns of chronic absence. This is why it's so important to have campaigns and strategies to address absences, starting with our youngest students. Next slide. And we know, unfortunately, chronic absence has doubled nationwide and kindergarten chronic absences are alarming. Not every state has this data, um, we're actually in the process of completing a scan of state policy and um, the data that's on state websites, only about 18 of states actually produce chronic, uh, chronic absence data by grade level. Um, the feds required it by school district um, and student subpop student group, but they didn't require it by grade. And by the way, this is something that if you haven't looked at your chronic absence levels by grade in your districts and schools, you should do that. But it is startling. Here in California, it's 40% of our kindergartners. And if we think this is going to affect the ability to read by the end of third grade, then this is a huge challenge that we have to address now. Next slide. We also know that in order to solve chronic absence, the key is understanding why kids are missing too much school in the first place. To what extent is it barriers, chronic and acute illness? Certainly in a pandemic, this has been huge. To what extent is, is it family or home situations, trauma, poor transportation, food and housing insecurity? Um, and yes, it's not, Kindergarten is often not mandatory in most states, but uh, mandatory means you could take a legal solution. But what we found is that legal solutions are often not what is um, really going to work. What's going to work is to help families to understand uh, why showing up to school matters so much and make sure that we're understanding what are the barriers that are preventing them from getting there in the first place. And again, these buckets of Barriers, aversion, disengagement, or misconceptions. And misconceptions are a big deal as well when kids are little um, because families don't necessarily understand how important that early learning is. 
And I also think that right now you have a lot of challenges connected to health uh, that have uh, continued with the pandemic, both questions about how you get kids to school. When do you send kids to school? Uh, if you have a sniffle, um, we've tended to send kids to school um, for any symptom now during the pandemic, when often symptoms aren't reasons kids should be kept home from school. Um, when kids have anxiety, they have stomach aches. Uh, and a key strategy has been, and we may need to return to, is making sure that um, folks address kids' anxiety and recognize that those uh, ailments related anxiety are actually not a reason to keep kids from school, but are actually a reason to keep kids in a routine of being in school. Next slide. So this is a sign when we have the high levels of chronic absence that we're seeing now that positive conditions for learning just have been eroded for families. Uh, they're not feeling physically and emotionally healthy and safe. That sense of belonging, connection, support, academic challenge and engagement are not surrounded by students and adults who have that well-being and emotional competence so that they can engage in those relationship building, which is so key to all of these four elements. But the good news is if we know that this is a challenge, we also know how to recreate these conditions and get kids to school. Next slide. Keep clicking. So this is about taking a multi-tiered system of support of which the first most important tier is building those foundational supports for those positive conditions of learning that you just saw, adding on to tier one, universal prevention, tier two, early intervention, and then intensive interventions. Next slide. This is about taking a systemic approach where we use our actionable data to know where we need to deepen our positive engagement, engage in strategic partnerships, ensure adequate and equitable resources, see this as shared accountability, and then building capacity to do all of this so we can put in place those positive conditions of learning and tiered supports in every school and make them available to every family. Next slide. So I wanna give you a few resources. One resource is our brand new Attendance Playbook 3.0. Um, kudos to Future Ed, particularly Phyllis Jordan, who is the author of this report, uh, but we were so happy to partner with her. It shows interventions based on each one of these tiers. Um, I think we can also make sure that the link to this goes into the chat. Um, this gives, if you go to the next slide, um, shows a whole array of resources, the most being on these foundational support and school-wide prevention related strategies that are really based on relationship building with students, with families, and then creating those other positive conditions for learning. It also offers targeted supports and intensive support and shows you what the research is that these are based upon and tells you um, uh, how much there is an evidence base that you can uh, call upon when you're thinking about implementation. Next slide. Um, and at this point, I would like to invent, invite Hisela Ariza, our wonderful Associate Director of Programs, to tell us about how people can also galvanize their communities through our 2023 attendance awareness campaign. Um, we are now 11 years into this and we see this as an easy on-ramp for those of you who are joining us on this webinar to get your communities, get your schools involved in the kind of messaging and engagement that will help us get all our kids to school. So Gisela, take it away. Thank you so much, Hetty, and thank you to the GLR team for having me. I'm very excited to share with you uh, information about our 11th annual attendance awareness campaign. Next slide. So this year's uh, theme is showing up together, uh, which communicates the critical 
critical need for building and sustaining trusting relationships among students, families, uh, and educators, as well as the need for community schools, uh, districts, and families to pitch in and work together to address uh, today's very high levels of student disengagement and absenteeism. Uh, so this year, we are also lifting the importance of creating a sense of belonging at school for all students and staff, and the idea that school is for everyone, no matter what. Next slide. This campaign is supported by nine convening partners and 90 plus collaborating partners. Uh, our convening partners are all national nonprofit groups that provide advice and ideas for our annual theme, you know, key messages and other key components of the campaign. And of course, the Campaign for Grade Level Reading has been a critical partner uh, since the inception of this campaign 11 years ago. And we are extremely grateful for our partnership. Next slide. So our campaign is organized around uh, three key strategies. Uh, the first one being strategic messaging and awareness building campaign, which designates September as Attendance Awareness Month as the launch of a year long attendance campaigns, community level action and engagement, and finally national and local level public events that raise public awareness about attendance. Next slide. And we'll share this, uh, uh, the, the link in the chat. Uh, the Attendance Awareness Campaign website is where you can sign up for the campaign. And we certainly invite you to, to do that. Uh, you can find free social media resources, posters, and our 2023 ca campaign image uh, on a badge that you just saw in a previous slide. And you can take that image, uh, that badge, and you can use it for your own materials. So I really encourage you to check out the website and sign up for our email list so that you can stay engaged and have access to tons of great resources that you can use. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, it's all there. Next slide. This year, we also updated the Count Us In Toolkit for the 2022-23 school year. It provides an easy on-ramp for creating a local or statewide awareness campaign. It offers tips, uh, templates, and evidence-based strategies uh, to help you raise awareness about the value of being in school. And again, you can find all of this on our website. Next slide. We are also hosting a series of webinars as part of the campaign. We are halfway through those webinars, but you can find the recording to the first two webinars on the website. And then you can also re uh, register for the uh, next uh, uh, two upcoming um, webinars. The webinar in August will be focused on establishing a welcoming and healthy return to school uh, to ensure that students show up. So we invite you to, again, uh, be part of this campaign and join the webinars if you're able to. Uh, next slide. And if you have any questions at all about this campaign, uh, you are, uh, we encourage you to contact, you can contact Teddy or myself, but also contact our colleague, uh, Catherine uh, Cooney, who is sort of leading the awareness campaign, and she'll, she would be more than glad to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Hetty. Thank you so much. And now let's stop showing slides, and we're going to bring um, the entire panel together for a really interactive session where we can hear from our colleagues on the ground um, about how they've done this work. So we'll have um, Ken, Hortensia, as well as Rosie, please um, have them also on the screen with us. Um, and as we're doing that, I'm gonna actually um, ask Rosie to help start us off by telling us a bit about, so Rosie, how, and wh why did you get involved in launching a local attendance awareness campaign in the first place? Thank you, Hetty. Happy to. Good afternoon, everyone. We actually started our work in Patterson as a part of a solutions not suspension campaign. And this is a campaign that we were doing to keep kids in school to end the school to prison pipeline. And then Shortly after that, of course, we saw the alignment between suspend and suspension and attendance. The schools with the highest suspension levels also had the highest um, attendance issues. So along came the grade level reading campaign, and we went, oh, this is great. We had been looking at all grades in all schools, and 
putting together our first community solutions action plan helped us to hone in on reading by third grade. And of course, attendance was one of the pillars of the grade level reading campaign as we started out. So we narrowed our focus. We started looking at preschool through third grade. And the one thing that was common is we know that kids who are not in school are not learning. Um, so through the grade level reading campaign, we met Hetty and her team. Uh, and that was really good fortune for us because we had a great launch to the attendance work that we, no pun intended, the attendance work that we had to do in our community of Patterson. Uh, so that's that's how we got started, just really trying to keep kids in school because we knew that they needed to be there in order to learn. And remember, this was pre-pandemic, and so they nobody was learning online. Uh, so that was not even an option at the time. Thank so that's you, our Rosie. Noble start. <laughs> yeah, and we'll come back to those early experiences and what you learned from that. Hortensia, why did why did you why did Caldwell School District get involved in all of this? So we really think that uh, attendance and community schools really go hand in hand. Um, I actually had an administrator just recently describe attendance as part of the symptoms that we it's like the symptom to the priority. So other through our community school work, we identify key focus areas um, that our families are uh, like barriers to their success. And so attendance is a symptom to all those barriers, health. Um, child care. And so it goes in hand in hand. And so we were doing a lot of work specifically at Sacagawea, and there was a couple other schools in, in the district, uh, but we was kind of, we're working in silos. Each school was kind of doing their own thing. But with my transition to the district, it was really a huge opportunity for us to do something more cohesively and really set district-wide expectations on what attendance meant what good attendance meant not we're really trying to get away from that thought of perfect attendance but really what is great what is great attendance and why it's important and so we really wanted to capitalize on the expansion of our community schools throughout the district and tie that in with attendance because now we were going to have the capacity and sometimes when we look at campaigns or we want to do work it's, it's more tied to the capacity who in um, our district was able to take this on and so with the experience and kind of seeing the need in our, one of our buildings and talking to some other buildings in the district, we thought, well, why wouldn't we do this as an entire district and really set those expectations? We do it with everything else. Um, so attendance just has to be another, another uh, expectation uh, for success for all of our kiddos. Right, that so, um, brings out both the capacity, but also the value of consistency. Uh, messaging exactly. when you say it in a consistent way is more likely to be heard and interpreted in the way that you wanted it. Yeah. Ken, how about you? Thank you. And once again, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we got involved because we know at United Way of Delaware, we know that opportunity exists for some, but not for all. We believe too many children are living in poverty and too many families live in crisis. We fight to maximize community resources to improve the quality of life for all. As Hetty alluded to in her presentation, we know that the research tells us that school attendance is a powerful predictor for student outcomes and irregular attendance can be a better predictor of whether a student will drop out of school before graduation than test scores. The correlation between attendance and dropout rates has important ramifications that go beyond the classrooms. Students who fail to complete their high school education are more likely to live in poverty, suffer from poor health, and become involved in the criminal justice system. Partnering with the attendance works, partnering with attendance works and collaborating to launch an attendance campaign is equally important to me because I was the product of a single parent, low income household. My mother instilled in me at an early age that education would be the key to my, the key to my success as an adult. My goal in life now is to pay that motto forward with working with students throughout Delaware, specifically in Wilmington, to make sure they are attending school on time and on a regular basis and ready to learn. And that's why we have, you know, launched our initiative to get involved. 
Thank you, Ken, for adding in the personal along with the professional story. And just to be clear, so folks know, so um, Ken, Ken made clear he was coming in from Wilmington, Delaware, or Tensia is at the Caldwell School District, which is in a more rural area of Idaho. Uh, and then Rosie Grant is um, in Patterson, and Patterson, New Jersey is located next to Newark. I'm thinking Rosie people are maybe a little more <laughs> familiar with Newark than Patterson, New Jersey. Um, so you give a sense of this incredible um, array. And Hisela, who's joining us, is actually coming calling in from Los Angeles, California. So we got the country covered, <laughs> west to east. Um, let's talk about the next um, part. And I, I'm going to actually ask Hortensia to start us off. What have you done in the past to advance attendance awareness? And, and what did you found to be effective? And I know you've got a video, so that's a heads up to the GLR team to, to start get prepping up your video so that you can um, sh they can show it. And maybe Hortensia, give us a little background on that video um, as they're about to show it. Yeah, so, you know, um, what I really appreciate and, you know, kind of really big shout out to Attendance Works was kind of giving us like this roadmap and and the flexibility of making our attendance campaign or even just how we communicate about attendance very unique to our community especially here in you know rural idaho and so you know our focus is kind of again like those preventative measures the positive relationship because if kids are wanting to come to school then we can focus on the teaching component of that and so we really you know the that messaging i think has really helped us and so we really stuck with our a campaign slogan of everyday matters. Um, but it was an expectation that we shared with throughout the entire district of not only are our kiddos expected to come to school every day, but our staff is expected to come to school every day. And so it was a commitment from, you know, our youngest learners, our preschool population, to our seniors, but to parents, aunts, uncles, anyone that really had any sort of contact or involvement with our kids, they were really taking on like this pledge of saying everyday matters and our kiddos you know, they're in order for them to be thriving, they need to be in our buildings. And so um, we wanted to really use the video as kind of like our messaging tool. And again, we just shared it via every platform that we could. Uh, we've had, we had many different partners involved in the planning process. We try to hit on, you know, you know, even those uh, folks in our community that don't have kids in the building, you know, when it's, you tie their tax dollars to, um, you know, supporting our education system. So the video is really encompassing everyone in our community because it really does take a village. Um, and so we wanted to highlight that. All right, let's take a look. I want to welcome you back to our new school year. Bienvenidos a nuestro nuevo año escolar. For the past few years, school has looked different for many students, some learning in classrooms, some learning at home, and some from both places. It may be easy for students to lose interest, but it's more important than ever to attend school every day. Regular attendance sets your child up and our students up for success throughout their entire life. Let's use this new school year as an opportunity for new beginnings because we know every day matters. Every day matters. Attendance is really important because when we think about how instruction takes place is the instruction builds on the day before. And so if you miss a day as a student, you miss uh, that instruction and there could be some gaps in your learning. Attendance also helps you build relationships with your friends and your teachers and the staff at your school. So really when we think about attendance as well is we want to ensure that students are not missing more than nine days a semester or 18 days a year. And when they do, that's when a lot of those gaps begin to form. As a parent who has seen my kids go through the Caldwell School District, I personally know the importance of good attendance. I know that strong school attendance affects children at every age. Early childhood students perform better academically and socially. Third graders are more likely to read proficiently. Middle schoolers are more likely to earn passing grades. And in high schoolers are more likely to graduate. Missing just two days of school a month has a negative impact. That's why in our household, we made attendance a priority because we know every day matters. Cada día cuenta. I know that perhaps my current title is mayor, but I'm also more than that. A Caldwell High School alumni, a parent, and a member of the Caldwell community. I know every minute your child is in school helps them and your school. 
School budgets are based on student attendance, which means when more students are learning in class every day, more funding is available for opportunities that impact your child and the entire community. We here at the City of Caldwell know that every day matters. When my students are learning in my classroom regularly, either physically or virtually, I can introduce new material and the class learns at a faster rate. By encouraging your child to be persistent and committed to their learning every day, despite potential challenges in how or where they learn, you are setting the foundation for future success. We are still navigating these challenging moments in time. Our children's future success depends on us taking action now. We invite you to partner with us to make sure our children are present, engaged, and learning together every day. That is fabulous, Hortensia. Why don't we keep going? Um, since, and we're going to go to each ca uh, community, and then we're actually going to come back to what people are doing uh, now, but this, uh, some of the challenges and what they're seeing as they go in the future. But this is sort of just taking stock of our lessons learned from all this past work. So Rosie, would you go next and talk about, so what have you done in the past to advance attendance awareness um, in, uh, in Patterson, New Jersey, and what did you find to be most effective? We've done a lot. <laughs> we have lots of partners working at this, and we've had to think about in-school strategies as well as community strategies. Uh, so we started out by having focus groups with our preschool parents and asked them the reasons for keeping kids out of school. And we learned that there were lots of reasons, like the car broke down or the parents didn't feel well, or they just couldn't get up, <laughs> another child sick, um, and the, the one thing is that preschool isn't mandatory in New Jersey, nor is it paid everywhere. We're fortunate to have it full day preschool for free in Patterson, but some parents thought it was optional. You know, they, they were treating it as daycare. So we realized we had a lot of educating to do. We put up our, our citywide strategies, we put up billboards at the entrances to the city so that anyone driving into, into the city could get the message about how important attendance was. We had banners stretched across all the major roadways uh, so that folks could see them as well. Uh, we ran a public service announcement, which we created with some local folks and it ran in all the, and with attendance works, and it ran with all the movie trailers. So it didn't matter what movie you went to see at the only cinema in town, you were going to see the attendance video as well, along with all the other trailers. Rosie, well, someone in the chat's asking, um, what did your banner say? Um, it's, it had a hashtag, PPS show up. And it had a picture of kids, and I can't remember what the other messages. It also had Patterson reads, uh, but it was it was the PPS show up that was the big thing. And then, of course, we picked that up in our social media campaigns as well, and tried to use the hashtag everywhere. Uh, we we created in schools. We created attendance teams at all the participating schools with with those grade levels. And everybody did the tier one interventions, but then we had success mentors and success plans for the kids who were perhaps at tier two. And as soon as a child missed the second day in a month, we considered them to be on track to becoming chronically absent. And so there's where people were connecting with the families, connecting with the child, we made sure the child knew that they had uh, an advocate in school, and it's, hey, we missed you yesterday kind of thing to encourage them to come to school more often so that they were welcomed and felt good about being there. We had great re results, you know, we, we were doing great, we were reducing chronic absenteeism in Patterson, and then the pandemic hit, so we'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right, thank you, Rosie, and one thing I think was interesting to see that, um, even in the one of the elementary schools, my memory is also a community school, um, yes. Hortensia. So, you know, that notion of 
a community school helping people have capacity is really important, but it was so successful. And then the principal later on became a district administrator, which was really helpful for also um, expanding commitment and, and results elsewhere. Ken, what have, what have you all done in, in Delaware around um, attendance awareness campaigns? Yeah, um, I think I want I want to start off by saying in my community school days, it was really working with the parents and the community surrounding the school at the grassroots level. Just really, you know, being able to go into the community and if you notice uh, certain students aren't attending school or they're not there by a certain time, just being able to have that flexibility to to go up the street and knock on the door or because you have a personal relationship with the parent, just calling the parent to say, hey. I notice, you know, such and such is in that school right now. Uh, what's going on? Do you need me to come pick them up? Or are you just running late? Just really trying to ID what those barriers were and then just figure out a way to eliminate them. Like we used to pass out alarm clocks and, you know, we would have parent links that would go off at a certain time to inform parents that, you know, it's now past a certain time that the students, you know, everyone should be in school. You know, we've made great partnerships with transportation companies to really ensure that all of their routes were running on time and able to ensure students were getting to school on time. And now my capacity with United Way of Delaware, we have the great opportunity to work with uh, great partners such as parents as teachers who now have picked up that mantle and now they're the ones going out into the community um, in a more widespread basis to really do those in-person home visits to eliminate those barriers provide resources, and to put parents on a trajectory for success. We know that the, the student success is tied to the parent success. We really want to leverage our community partners to put parents in the best situation as possible to ensure that we're meeting the need and wrapping our collective arms around the families to ensure success. Before we shift to the next question, which is more about the current challenges, there was a question in the chat that I wanted to just draw upon past experiences from any of you. And the question was, what did you find particularly effective in working with pre-K parents? Um, and, and Rosie, I particularly wonder if you had any insights from your pre-K um, focus groups and, and how is that maybe different from older parents? I think the focus group itself was probably most effective. Although we were trying to gather data from them, they began to network with each other and they talked about the issues. Like who knew that not having a raincoat or an umbrella would prevent a child from coming to school for the day and they would miss all of that. Uh, so I think the most effective piece with the preschool parents was getting them talking to each other about the issues. Uh, they came up with ideas like I could do a walking school bus. I could pick this child up. You're right on my way. So that connection and relationship building among the parents was very effective. Also, you know, it doesn't hurt to have incentives, right? So if a child knows that their class can win a pizza party, uh, if they all come to school for the month, they, they actually influence their parents around that. And then also just incentives in a box for the, the kid who the kids who are not chronically absent, et cetera. You know, Rosie, um, it, it also reminds me of research. I think this was done both in Baltimore and Chicago might have also had some research that showed that when parents were part of more in-depth support, when they had social networks, um, and I think we all know this, all of us who had kids, when you have, you know, you don't get your kid to school just by yourself. Stuff always happens. What helps you get to get your kid to school is you have an array of parents. And what the social group you were talking about with the the, the um, focus groups were helping to reinforce those social networks. Um, and a, both a parent, there is some research that suggests having the deeper your social networks, the more likely you're to get your kid to school. And the more you actually have been in school, so you, well, the more you understand what kids are actually learning, that it isn't, I think Hortensia, we're talking about, um, was it, oh no, maybe it, Rosie, you were talking about people thought of kindergarten as babysitting. Mm -hmm. But if folks actually understood, this isn't about graduation at high school, this is about what my kids learned now, they were more likely to get their kids um, to school. 
with that as context, I would love to hear a bit more. And I might stick with you for again, Rosie, because I know you've also been doing focus groups with kindergarten families. What are you seeing as a particular challenges and opportunities right now with the pandemic? As we came out of the shutdown, we saw the chronic absenteeism rates rise and just attendance in general plummet. And so, and somebody asked about funder, I'll, I'll go back to the funder piece, but a funder asked, well, how can we help? And what that, that gave us an opportunity to say, the thing that we're most concerned about right now is attendance. Uh, can we get attendance works uh, some of their time to work with us to devise some strategies that are particular to Patterson? Can we get somebody to host some focus groups uh, so that we hear from parents? And we did that, uh, but you needed money to do that. So we had a team from Patterson Public Schools participate in some intensive trainings with Attendance Works. Uh, we had what we learned from the parent focus group surprised us. They were concerned about screen time distractions. Uh, the one that rose to the top was they didn't know when to keep their kids home and when to send them to school after the pandemic because one sneeze and everybody was looking at the child and, and maybe was allergies, but they'd rather keep them home than have the child be embarrassed. Uh, there was confusion around the rules and the protocols there. Uh, there was a location and transportation issue that rose to the top. Our community bus kids that are 2.5 miles away from school, we're a very small community. We're in eight square miles with 52 school buildings. So most of our kids, even if they go to school across town, might get to 2.4, not 2.5, but that's a tough walk for a kindergartner or a preschool student or you know, for kids who are working. So again, to that communication and social network about how to get the child to school if they can't get on the bus. And then we also heard some uh, uh, challenges around school start time, overlapping school schedules when, when there are other students in the household and start times that are dis disruptive to parents' work schedules. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. We have fed this information to the administration and we're looking for strategies about how to go at these challenges so that we can ensure that every child has the opportunity to get to school every day. Did you get any insights into what helped families get their kids to school, even despite all these challenges? Were there things that stood out as things that motivated kids to show up to school? Because I, if I remember correctly, your, your focus group both asked about challenges, but what are the things that, that pulled parents in? Uh, kids wanted to be in school. They want to be in school because they've been in shutdown for too long. Uh, so that was one thing is that the child was ready to have these social interactions. Uh, maybe some parents are still using school as babysitting, but that's okay because they had to return to work. So they had to send the children to school and the friendships pull them to school as well. So we're back to relationships. The relationships with the caring, competent adults inside the school building uh, played a major role in what keeps them coming to school. And I think those are the ones I remember off the top of my head, but Hedy, if you remember others, please chime in. <laughs> well, the one other thing I remember being particular was, I think you had one school that was a district focus group where they talked about the staff inviting the parents Yes. Uh, who are Muslim into yes. the school. Uh, can you say a bit more um, sure. about that? Sure. So this, this school and many of our schools provide a place for the children to be during Ramadan when they're not eating at the same times that the rest of the, the population are. So traditionally, kids who are not eating would sit and watch others eat in the cafeteria. So now our schools are providing space for the students to pray or, or just not watch everybody else eat. 
and then also providing the time for them to eat when that does happen during the school day. Uh, so that was one consideration that parents really appreciated and they felt more comfortable sending their children to school knowing that that accommodation was being made for them. And if, and if I remember correctly, you even involved some of the parents in helping to supervise some of that space. And um, one of the things that makes me occur, this is Kansas did this whole uh, um, survey. Uh, they had a parent engagement survey and they also looked at their chronic absence rates and they found that schools that were uh, more likely to engage parents in decision making and, 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 you know, helping to design things combined with make school that a welcoming environment had lower levels of chronic absence. And I feel like the examples that you're hearing are also sharing. So I just think it's so helpful to think about both the challenges, but what do we also know about what keeps cat, kids and families showing up to school, uh, even despite these challenges? Hortensia, how does this connect to, to, to what you you saw or what you've seen um, also in, in, in Idaho? Yeah, so I, I would say for us, one of the challenges that we've seen um, was basically kids raising kids or kids basically um, are the child care provider. So a lot of parents had to take up multiple jobs. And so because of that, we were seeing a lot of our older, you know, it was, it was an impact from our pre-K, the 12th graders, our older siblings, or even our middle school age siblings having to be that child care because when things shut down, you know, where do they take their kiddos uh, because of the pandemic? And so we had a lot of middle school and, and high school kiddos really missing out on school uh, because they were having to take care of their little ones. And then we'd see the little ones not coming to school because they're being left in the in the care of a 11, 12 year old. And so it was really this whole impact of, of kind of our families having to be in constant survival mode. And so I think one of the biggest things with the reason, real reason that we've dived so deep into attendance and chronic absenteeism has been, it's, it's not because our kids and families, our kids don't want to come to school or because our families don't want to send their kids to school. It's because there's so many out, you know, external factors um, that impact the ability for our kids and families to come to school. And so if we're able to understand those, understand that childcare is an issue. So then we partner with the Boys and Girls Club to open up a facility at one of our schools. So that way that family that has been struggling, they're able to bring their kiddo and now into the building now that we're kind of sort of out of the pandemic. Um, but, you know, on the bright side, one of the things that we have definitely seen as an opportunity for us here is this eagerness. Um, so one of our community schools, um, you know, Sacagawea that had been a community school, we, we did pretty well during the pandemic because we had built so many relationships. But we did take a hit with our families in terms of like having to shut them out of our building, right? You know, we we brought the kids back in. We were now in uh, learning in the classroom full time, but parents still couldn't come in and you know be a part of awards assemblies or even volunteer in their kids' classroom. We had to be very like family events didn't happen, and so but now that we've kind of have un undone all those restrictions. Families are eager to be in the building. Families are eager to be in their kiddos' classroom. And so as we know, if families are engaged in, in, and in a partnership with their child's teacher or the child's school, there's a higher chance of their kiddo coming to school and, and doing well and excelling in the classroom. And so we're really trying to capitalize on that, like this excitement of like, our buildings are open now, so let's bring our families back in. Let's continue building and strengthening those relationships and continue educating them, especially, you know, going back to that preschool reference, I think, you know, the education piece, not only for our parents of why it's important for them to come to school, but our preschool staff of why it's important to make attendance a big deal, even for a three-year-old. We're setting up really good habits as a three-year-old of why it's so exciting to come to school. Um, but so we, you know, we're really trying to capitalize on that opportunity of our families are eager to rebuild and, and to strengthen those relationships with our school. Thank you. That is so helpful. And it does make me think that this, what you're, the, at least the health challenge is both related to when do you send kids, but do I show up to school as you were saying, Hortensia, you know, because that's why we opened up for kids, not for adults. One of the, I think, opportunities in our attendance awareness campaign is to um, realign people's understanding of uh, the health guidance about showing up to school or not. Uh, we, we've been talking with doctors and know that doc, a lot of doctors and nurses say we're back to pre-pandemic. Unless you test positive for COVID, basically you show up to school. You know, it, 
A sniffle does not mean you stay home. A stomach ache does not mean you stay home. A stomach, mean, you know, you if generally well and be able to function, you should show up to school and parents can show up to school too. But we're going to need to do some unlearning of three years of any sign of illness, I stay home. Uh, and maybe that's one of, and, and we're hoping actually the Tenants of Works to offer some materials that people can use. We're, we're exploring those, but I, I think that's something that, that we're going to have to take some explicit messaging. Ken, how does this connect to, to what you've seen? What are other challenges or opportunities um, you see? Yeah, I think one of our challenges were like after, after COVID, I think everyone was just in a different place. Like the population in our in our communities were just so transient at the time um, mm -hmm. because of various reasons. A lot of our families were doubled up and it just took a while for everyone just to get back in the groove of education and returning to school. But now throughout the state of Delaware, I really see a shift taking place that individuals and organizations don't want to work in silos anymore. Like we're coming together more collectively as a state to really work together because I think we recognize and understand that we're all trying to serve the same families. So it's not really making sense for us to, you know, resources are over here and resources are over there. Let's pull together all of our resources. We can collectively impact our communities throughout the state um, on a better, broader level. Um, so right now I'm just excited about the opportunity for Delaware, where we're going, uh, realizing where we've come from. And it's just a really exciting time now. And to really be a partner through the campaign for grade level reading and then partnering with Attendance Works to really launch this initiative and really be intentional and strategic about bringing the information to our communities on their level, um, really using the data and breaking it down for parents that they can understand it. Um, I think now there's such a big emphasis on uh, on mindfulness, and it was so good when Rosie was talking about um, how she did her groups. I just had an envisioning like parents sitting in their group, and you know everyone has their eyes closed, and just say, envision your child walking across that kindergarten graduation stage. Imagine your child at the end of sixth grade. Imagine your child at the end of twelfth grade. Now, where do you see yourself in that picture? And how can we help you to make that vision come true for your children? So it's, it's once again, it's just the messaging, creating those partnerships and those relationships with parents and families and communities that's really going to be essential to closing the gap on chronic absenteeism. Thank you, Ken. That's so powerful. It really makes me, what you're actually doing is almost reinstilling hope. You're instilling a vision as you were talking about your-, your right. uh, your meditation activity that you have families starting with. <laughs> it's about getting them to see a different future and, and reminding them that they can attain that. That's so right. uh, I'd love for you to join us as well. Um, are there particular challenges or opportunities um, in the work that you've started to do across the country? Yeah, so, you know, um, as um, in the last few months been working with schools and districts, um, they have shared that they are experiencing a rise in absenteeism among staff, you know, including their teachers and administrators. Um, you know, we've heard of some cases where district administrators are having to teach classrooms because they can't find substitutes uh, to cover classes. Um, and, you know, that challenge is in addition to the staff shortages that were being experienced before the pandemic. Uh, so like students, educators are also experiencing increased anxiety, mental health challenges, stress and burnout. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to rethink how we support adults in our schools. Um, and it makes me think about those positive conditions of learning Hetty that you shared earlier. And we know that the adults can also benefit when a warm and wel welcoming environment is established. Um, we know that they can benefit from a workplace that is intentionally creating a sense of belonging and helping to foster connection. So I think those same strategies that we are thinking um, is going to help us rebuild um, our schools and our communities with students and, you know, and families are also the same things that are going to help us as educators feel much more connected and, and, and grounded to the work that we're doing with students. Great. And we're going to come back to the questions in the Q&A box, but as we, we end this kind of panel session, um, Ken, might you start off, what are 
your top plans for the coming year? Um, Hetty, I have to be honest with you. After we had our initial um, planning meeting, I was just so excited and inspired, especially after seeing the video. In my head, I was like, I want to create one too. You know what I mean? So I think my plans are really just having a, a conversation with my marketing team and just really creating something similar in terms of a video and really using our social media platforms to highlight the importance of attendance and once again, showing up every day. So just to, I'm once again excited about the possibilities and just working with our partners to really be intentional. Um, I mean, I would love to have the opportunity to have billboards and we still use flyers to a certain degree. Um, and once again, social media, but once again, just really being at the grassroots level, just creating that campaign and that awareness and really going into the communities and we just have to go back to what we know works. And I mean, sometimes what we know works is being personal with the parents, creating those personal relationships that we feel comfortable to be able to go knock on a door, knock on a few doors and reinstilling those block captains and having that community person walk several students to school. So just really getting back to grassroots and just making sure that we're instilling the information but also making sure that it's relevant and timely and that everyone is on a certain level so that everyone can understand it, digest it, and then turn around and implement it in an easy, effective manner. Thank you, Ken. And I think you're speaking to some of the strengths that United Ways have, um, mm -hmm. both the ability to maybe create a marketing material uh, like a video. And you know, United Way Greater Kansas City actually did that during the pandemic. Um, we can show you something. So, so there's precedent <laughs> for United Ways because your ability then to get it out across multiple districts Right. Um, you can have a, a kind of a scale and then convene community partners. So lots of folks are using it. Um, that is something that you all um, are, are uniquely positioned to do. Um, Rosie, what about you? What are your some, some of your plans for next year? We have an in-district strategy and a community strategy. So the district team uh, is planning to engage three schools in the student success plans and deep implementation. I hope that there will be tier one supports across the district. And I'm, I'm just going to say something. These are the attendance work student success plans with Little Help Bank, and we'll have someone stick this in the chat. Uh, and their staff have been really equipped to talk with kids about and families about how do they adopt those plans. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to see it in every building, but we have to think about capacity. Uh, we have 48 preschool classrooms in 14 build, buildings in district, and then we have 22 community providers with another 170 classrooms. We're really focused on the rising kindergarten students as we launch this. Uh, so they're starting with three and I'm, uh, I'll am i be advocating for more as we progress. Uh, in the community with Patterson Education Fund and our Patterson Reads partners, we'll engage broadly through social media, through regular media, uh, advocacy for broader implementation, et cetera. So we're gonna be working hard to make sure the messages get out to the broader community while the district focuses on the schools with the um, most challenges. And how about you, Hortensia? Yeah, so I, I think I'm gonna follow a little bit of Rosie's plan, yeah. We, so, well, the very first thing is I have to go back to our communications director and be like, we have to revise the videos just a bit, um, just because now, like watching it now at the end of the year, some of the language and, and connection with like our remote learning and, and certain things are just not gonna be applicable for next year. So definitely, but because we really did love using the video as like an educational piece. Um, but I think, you know, being able to have a couple of community schools throughout the district, uh, we had a trial and error kind of year with one of the buildings that hasn't had a community, uh, hasn't, hasn't had an attendance team um, before. And so we learned a lot in terms of what it really takes to run an attendance team fluidly with, you know, what the purpose is. Um, and I, I have to stress, you know, being the boots on the ground, building, you know, being in buildings, principal leadership has to be a big role in this. Um, so, you know, as being, you know, district wide, I were able to do a lot of that community impact, get partners involved, um, but also maybe even as a district kind of ask administrators, 
as you prepare your new school year strategic plan, where does attendance fall into your strategic plan? Um, and how are you tracking this? And so um, with our community schools, we, that is a focus for all of their priorities. Um, they've all identified four or five. And so, um, so that's something that they have to be able to use as a, as like a, um, as a metric of saying like, oh, is our work being impactful? Are we seeing a reduction in kiddos that are chronically absent? Um, and so still doing a lot of the advocacy, a lot of the educational piece uh, of work, and then, you know, keeping up with that celebratory month of uh, September, instilling really good habits at that month, but um, really using the campaign as the entire district role, but then looking at those other tiered approaches. Great, thank you. I am now gonna start going into the Q&A and one of them, Hortensia, I think is a little bit um, maybe directed to you because it was a comment that you had, that was on your video, mm -hmm. uh, which is why is attendance connected to funding? And does that make it hard for schools to have resources to address the underlying factors contributing to chronic absenteeism? Yeah, so this is actually new here in the state of Idaho, I believe. And if there's any other of my colleagues on the call, that'd be great if you could back me up. But so currently, the state of Idaho, some of the state funding allocations for school districts are being have have been tied with enrollment numbers. Um, this new coming school year, our some of our funding is now will now be tied to attendance. Um, and so I believe that's still geared towards like our average daily attendance numbers, which we know is is different from our chronically uh, from our chronically absent student numbers. Um, but they will be tying some of our funding to that. So schools now are even more eager um, to making sure you know attendance is a priority. However, coming from the world of you know focusing on chronic absenteeism, I still have to come in and explain like there's a difference from your ADA. Um, to your chronic absenteeism, and this is why this matters. Um, and so I think that's where some of this, uh, oh, Tamara's on, uh, um, so I will read what uh, our federal director's uh, response is. Um, Idaho school funding has been always based on attendance. However, during the pandemic, our state board gave emergency funding on enrollment instead. Um, and so I think we're just gonna be heading back to attendance funding. So, Artinti, let me give a little national context. So there's about uh, average daily attendance has been used as a basis for funding in about six, seven states. Um, California, Kentucky, Idaho, uh, Texas have historically been uh, those, uh, I think Indiana, I'm now forgetting, but there's like, and, and Florida does a mix. I'm not sure how states do mixes, but Florida managed to fund some on enrollment and some on attendance, uh, average daily attendance. Um, in those states, to answer the question about um, underlying factors, most of them, I think, tend to weight the average daily attendance pretty heavily. So the higher you have of higher needs kids, they get more. Whether that fully compensates um, for um, the fact that often districts with lower income kids have ch more challenging attendance I think is, is a little bit hard to answer. And I think there have been a lot of tensions in states. Um, many of them put a shifted um, the process during the pandemic and now they're uh, back to ADA um, in California. There's actually a really good brief on this on, on how do you think about this in California um, and, and what are the impacts? It's actually not a simple answer about whether or not average daily attendance um, will penalize schools serving higher risk kids or not. A lot of it depends, uh, the devil's in the details on how you organize this. Um, and uh, uh, so, so but, it is, but it is definitely a tension. I will also say um, if kids are missing a lot of school, it's often a sign that you're gonna be facing enrollment challenges. So even states where um, attendance hasn't been used to fund schools, and I don't know if Rosie or Ken, in your state, you're seeing this, the decline in enrollment is also affecting uh, school funding. Um, and it may be important even in those cases to argue, well, if we don't address the chronic absence, kids may get disengaged and ultimately disenroll from our public school systems, which also is a real challenge. Um, so I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on the, the funding issue. 
Petty, uh, it, it was proposed that they would attach it to funding in New Jersey, but advocates pushed back. Uh, however, because you're punishing the kids who need the funding most, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's an inequitable solution when we think about attaching attendance to funding. Uh, however, it is one of our, um, with the ESSA, I yeah, I'm it's part of your ESSA accountability it is, metrics. It is a part of, it is an accountability measure in New Jersey. The interesting thing is at the preschool and kindergarten level, uh, neither of those grade levels are mandated in New Jersey. They're optional by district. However, if you do have them, it does count. Um, so for the people who do have preschool and do have kindergarten, it does count um, as an accountability measure. But if you don't have it, it's it's not an issue. So still a little bit of inequity around our um, how we're measuring uh, our accountability. Um, yeah. Clearly, this is not a, a simple issue. It's a complex one. Uh, and how do you balance making sure people attend to attendance with making sure they don't um, end up penalized and having less resources to serve the kids who need it most is, is attention. Mm -hmm. um, another question, and I'm actually wondering, Ken, if you might help us uh, think of uh, us answer this one or take a stab. It's, as a high dosage tutoring provider, we recognize that the impact of attendance on literacy on achievement, we recognize the impact of attendance on literacy achievement and how poor attendance prevents students from engaging in our program. Some of our tutors can get frustrated when their students are absent. What role can community partners play um, in raising awareness, eliminating bias and reducing chronic absenteeism? Yeah, I think one of the, depending on the relationship with the school, um, and I know there's some confidentiality issues, but if the, the tutoring service has the contact information for the parent or the family, I mean, maybe just reaching out to them to say, hey, we missed, you know, your student in tutoring today, um, and we really would like, you know, him or her to be here on a consistent basis. Once again, it's about relationships, right? So being, just being able to reach out or send a letter home or, just something that's still going to be positive, but then you're still reinforcing the message of how important that that the tu the tutoring is for the child, but then also how important it is for them to be in school as well. So for me, on that relationship piece, um, so just trying to figure out ways to to build that relationship with the family, um, and if you have to go through the school as well, continuing to build that relationship with the school to be able to get to the parent, forming a relationship with the student's teacher um, to really get through to the parents. So just trying to look at it at a number of different ways to really foster the, nat foster the relationship, but also navigating through some potential red tape to get through uh, to the parent, which is the ultimate goal to have the student there to receive the tutoring service. I'm gonna shift to, um a third question, which is um, these efforts are so localized, uh, was the quote. What kind of support are you getting from your state education departments? What resources from resources to funding and what kind of state policies changes would actually help your efforts? So I'll I'll start. We we do have it as an accountability measure. And so it helps people to think about reducing chronic absenteeism and increasing average daily attendance. Uh, we're not getting specific support from the state, except that they're expanding preschools and they're, you know, across the state, they're expanding funding preschools across the state. So we hope that we'll be able to help the communities who are just starting to, to have full day preschools to think about attendance as an important thing um, as they talk about attendance uh, and preschool with their parents. Uh, I wish they would give some more specific information. We do have a phenomenal statewide organization, Advocates for Children of New Jersey, that provides information to other communities. 
Yeah, our our state department of education, uh, our department of education. So it's when it, one thing that they're doing is providing as a platform. Uh, we were able to actually even have Hetty come out and visit us in November at our family and community engagement conference um, that is uh, that's put on by the state department of education. And so being able to provide us a platform, we're able to get more people. You know, we're able to continue the education piece and. Another big partner in this work for us is is our United Way. So, you know, shout out to all the United Ways for, you know, doing really critical work and partnering us with, with us in so many different ways. And so, you know, being able to have that platform and access to a lot of people really is going to help us with, you know, being able to reach out to our representatives, reach out to our, you know, our superintendents or, you know, our local organizations and and being able to ask, you know, this needs to be have attention drawn to. We need to be focusing on this. And so, um, you know, we're able to rile up the masses and being able to push for, you know, attention to be for us to provide the attention that it needs. And so, you know, it's slowly starting to get there. Um, you know, it's pretty neat that we're starting to see a lot of movement here in the state. Um, and so it's nice for us to have some champions within the department here. Ken, any thoughts about? Your State Department of Ed and what supports could be helpful? Yeah, I think our, our State Department of Ed has really been helpful and this has been like a key partner. Um, as we our, our main focus for me has been continue to champion our literacy efforts, but even with attendance, just knowing that we have them as a great resource and a great partner to be able to help champion um, this initiative now. And then uh, hats and congratulations to you as well, Hetty, because I know I've reached out to you on several occasions and you've been able to come on and do a presentation that really focuses in our, on our Delaware um, data and really sharing that with my school uh, points of contacts and partners to really do a deep dive into taking a look into our data and really showing our state the numbers and then seeing how our, our schools and our local department of education can really be involved. And I know this will probably be another conversation for another time, but what working with our legislators to see like, how can we make pre-K and kindergarten mandatory? I think as long as we leave it optional, we're gonna continue to get optional results. So if we figure out a way to make it mandatory, that may be a step in the right direction to ensuring that students are attending school on a regular basis. They are hitting those, those milestones that we know are so needed. Now in Delaware, a lot of our schools are really picking up on, uh, to Hortensia and myself's point, that community school model, where our schools are now uh, on more than, more than not, are hubs of resources where parents can come in and get a one-stop shop. So as you drop your student off to school, there's access to adult education, there's access to housing, there's access to food and, and food pantries. There's access to doing your laundry at the school. There's access to, to employment. There's access to just everything at schools. Um, so really just making sure that we continue to put funding behind those efforts so that you know when, when parents and, and students are coming to school, they're getting more than the education. But once again, we're surrounding our arms around families to really put them in better places than they were before. You know, um, Ken, uh, a couple things. I, I do uh, think there is a real value in making sure that the offer of kindergarten is something that every school is sort of mandated to offer and provide and idea full day. Full day. Mm -hmm. I'm less sure there's yet evidence that uh, making it compulsory so that uh, family, so so it's a hard thing. We got to message the importance of this. Court solutions are also not necessarily what get kindergartens are there. So how do we do this in a way that's messaging the critical importance and requiring districts to actually provide the services? And then I think we're going to have to take some harder looks at whether mandating K, because I um actually like in the sense of uh, if you don't go to kindergarten, we could take you to court. Um, may or may not uh, be a solution. I've not seen evidence that shows that. I, so I think it's really interesting as we think about what do we mean by mandating? There may be different ways of thinking about what we're trying to mandate. Rosie, you had a, 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 a your hand up there too. Thanks, Hetty. I, I wanted to make sure I could back up my statement earlier about the lack of assistance around this from the state. So I Googled um attendance in New Jersey DOE 
And it's all punitive. It's, it's all about what happens if your rate falls below a certain level. Uh, there's, there's no effort that I know of. So it's not coming to Patterson. And mind you, Patterson Reads is a local project. So I've talked about what we're doing locally, but I don't see anything. I, I wanna say again, coming from the state, helping people uh, around reducing chronic absenteeism and improving attendance. And then the second point I wanted to make is the importance of community schools in this, because as I look at our community schools, we now have 11 of them in Patterson, they tend to have better attendance rates and lower chronic absenteeism rates than the district-wide rates. And that's because of that wraparound services and, and attention to the things that Ken was just talking about, because our kids don't live in a vacuum. You know, school doesn't exist in a vacuum. And if they have a toothache, they're not coming to school. If they have a toothache and there's a dentist in the school, they're coming to school. And then they only miss, you know, maybe one period to go see the dentist, but they're there the rest of the time and, and so on. I just use a toothache as an example. Yeah, so I think um, what you guys are talking about is like there's a couple of things states can certainly do. One, when states make data easy to find and look, and you can notice what it the chronic absence levels are in your your district, that's a really helpful thing. Another thing is when states actually offer guidance on what's effective, positive problem solving, not just punitive approaches to improving attendance. Um, certainly, um, there are states like Connecticut, Ohio is just about to put on on its website resources that actually help give guidance. Uh, in Virginia, when they knew that a bunch of schools were gonna be um, highlighted for chronic absence uh, as part of ESSA accountability, they provided extra professional development and support. Um, and so, and then there's the issue of how do you allocate resources? Are states using data to allocate community schools resources? Uh, expanded learning resources, um, healthcare services that address that array uh, of supports and services. I wanted to ask Kisela if she would also join. Um, one of the questions that had come in the Q and A um, was uh, most much of what we've been talking about has been with the early kids, mm -hmm. uh, young kids. What about the older kids? And I'd actually like both Kisela and Artensia, who I know also focus a lot on older kids. What have you seen as effective strategies for older kids? Yeah, I think for older kids, because you know they have very strong opinions uh, and 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 feel strongly about their ideas. I think the 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 most important thing we can do with our older kids is engage them in the decision making process and in the planning process for for something like an attendance awareness campaign. I would sort of kind of task like the student council or the students to think about how they would sort of like create an entire campaign and think about the messaging and what would work and how do you get the message across, you know, uh, and help your peers understand the importance about attendance. And so that is something that we've seen um, our schools and districts share that with the older uh, students in high school, for example, um, you engage them in that way, having the conversation going directly to the to to the source, right? Asking them sort of what motivates you to come to school? And so what can we do? And not creating these plans in like a vacuum without getting their feedback. I think that would be sort of like uh, one of the one of the most important like strategies that I would suggest for folks uh, on this on this webinar. Hortensia, what would you offer? Well, I think it might have been in one of your webinars that I heard a community that actually offered night school. And I've, I have just thrown that out there because one of the things I think that has come out of the pandemic is that not only were older kids, you know, now taking care of the, your younger siblings, but high school age kids that had to get a job. And so now they're contributing ac economically to their household and, you know, helps with that survival mode. So um, if possible, I think that I thought was like, well, that is fantastic. I mean, there's even teachers that are not morning individuals or they're night owls, so why not? you know, have it as an opportunity. But I think things that, lo that logistically we're able to do, relationships, I mean, relationships are key in every category, but I think relationships are really essential, middle school, high school. And so if, if there is a kiddo that nobody has built a relationship with, then I think that's kind of a reflection on it as a school. Like, where are we missing building these relationships with these kids? 
And so, and so I think really ensuring that one of the attendance teams that works at the secondary level, what they do is instead of the team building that relationship or making that uh, phone call home, they identify immediately the teacher that that kid or the coach or the custodian or the cafeteria staff that has built a relationship with that kid. And that person is then tasked with reaching out to the family or having a conversation with the student. Um, because it's that relationship that is key. And so they're able to build up and figure out like, why are you not coming to school? What can we help you to get you to school? And kind of then reports back to the team of saying like, these are the barriers that the kiddos is um, uh, experiencing and you know, what can we do? And so um, at the secondary level, relationships are really the key to, to them coming to school. Um, one thing, I just want to make sure that the folks see the poll to fill out as kind of an evaluation of this, but I want to build on something you also said, Hortensia. Um, you know, we do these e-learning community of uh, web professional development sessions, and um, I find I learn things when people speak up on the webinars about what they're doing. And one place, and I love this one, they do a survey of all their kids. Um, uh, I think it's like a probably a month or two into the school year where they ask kids questions, what activities they like, what their favorite things, but they ask them, who's your safe person at our school? And they give them a list of people that the kid can pick from to say, if I have a challenge, this is the person who I feel safest to talk with. And then, um, and, and the person was saying that it was kind of funny because people started, hopefully this is, a, is a, in good, but, you know, like wanting to be known as a safe person, you know, it like was an, an incentive for the staff so that they, they knew that kids trusted them because they were being selected as a safe person. But there's something about both Gisela's point, kids need voice. So let me tell you who I feel I'm safe with as well as, um, you know, then making sure that there is that outreach and connection. And boy, if a kid can't name a safe person on your school campus that they can reach out to, we know we've got a challenge. So I think you can do that relationship mapping both ways, right? <laughs> Hedy, I've also been doing some healing-centered engagement environment work with an organization here in New Jersey, the New Jersey Principal and Supervisors Association. And what we've learned is caring and competent adults. Mm. Uh, so every child should have a caring and competent adult. And so it takes professional development as well, going back to the funding issue, to make sure that the people in your building can serve in these roles and and include your support staff. You know, it's not just the classroom teachers. Sometimes the person that a child feels most comfortable talking to would be the security guard or the custodian. And those people can also be your, your trusted messengers. They can be the person who is going, hey, Joe, you weren't here today, or is everything okay? Uh, the security guard standing outside the door can ask the parents, didn't see your son for a while, you know, are they okay? Are you okay? Et cetera. So think broadly about who these caring and competent people uh, can be inside your school buildings and your community. You know, Bob Balfence talks about that school connectedness is made up of a, a kid feels there's an adult, a, that caring, competent adult. A kid feels is connected to a group of peers that are, that positive connections to cares. A kid is also engaged in something pro-social, um, you know, that's building their community. And a, 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 and, a, and a child or a young person feels that the school is a welcoming environment. If you have those four things, then kids are much more likely to show up to school. Um, and, and that just might be something, you know, if you think about how do we gauge whether we have um, this work uh, in the, the conditions in place, those positive conditions for learning. It might be noticing for every child. And I actually think this works for the young ones too and families. Is there someone you trust? Is there a peer you connect to? Uh, is there something you're contributing to? You know, And uh, do you feel welcome? All right, with that, I wanna turn it back to Becky for any closing remarks from the campaign. Thank you, Hetty, so much for moderating this great conversation. 
Thank you, Hisela, Ordancia, Ken, and Rosie um, for being on with us and sharing the stories of your community. I think it really grounds us all when we can hear what's happening um, in, in a local community. Um, it makes all the difference. Um, special thanks to our ASL interpreters, Angela and Lisa, and um, to our extraordinary um, webinar producer, Sierra Sanchez, who's in the back background. Um, we have a slide, uh, if you'll pop that up, Sierra, of our upcoming webinars, and I posted in the chat how you can register for those. Um, we'll have our, our friends from Attendance Works back in just a couple of weeks uh, in June to talk with us about how housing agencies can support attendance and engagement. Back to that, how can, how can local partners be involved in this? Um, so uh, tune in to any of these and registration information is in the chat. And um, with that, um, thank you for filling out the poll. Thank you for being here. And we'll look forward to seeing you all again on another upcoming webinar.